let's have a look at this little guy. Opaque War <coughs> from uh, One War Magazine number 34. It's the March, April 2018 edition, just in case you cared. Uh, interesting game, uh, Simple Mechanics, set in the Ukraine crisis uh, 2014. And it, it's got some uh, interesting ideas built around some of the support counters, which uh, have mobs. And uh, let's see, there's a media dude here somewhere that I put in the wrong spot earlier on here. Uh, yeah, there's a media unit and there's a media table, which you roll on depending on what sort of combat result occurs and that can improve support for one side or the other. So that's an interesting idea. Uh, the vitro conditions, however, are also curious. Well, they're, they're curious, not also curious. We need to uh, control uh, Donatesque. And the way the rules are worded, all three hexes are worth one VP. This airfield is worth one VP. This city here in this other province or, or oblast, as it's called, uh, Luansk, Lansk, is worth one VP. And if the MH17 crash site happens to occur, then, and if the Ukraine forces, national forces control that, that's worth VP. And that, my friends, is it. Other than either side which uh, tries to enforce uh, or a, an adjustment or a DRM to a ceasefire role, that will move, that will add a VP to the opposing player every time they do that, right? Or subtract a VP, however you want to put it. So... <clears throat> Ceasefires are important because it's going to halve everyone's movement and no attacks are allowed. Now, if things are going really well for the Ukrainians and they've got all their locations uh, acquired and there hasn't been any Russian intervention yet because we need to roll a six on the reinforcement table for uh, Russians to enter. And that did not happen until game turn nine here of 15 then, you know, the not having, having a ceasefire, and we've got to roll for these ceasefires every turn, uh, so they're not going to happen every turn, but once it does happen, it does slow things down for that turn. So if, if the Ukrainians, you know, attempt to crush it really early and uh, capture as much as they can, and then attempt to... Uh, just ride out these ceasefires and hope that the, the, the ceasefire doesn't happen multiple times in a row before the Russians arrive and the Ukrainians uh, can put some forces in Kharkov or Denitropovsky or whatever it is over here uh, then they're going to be okay because they can capture all these VP locations relatively easily within the you know 15 turns or so certainly all of this was captured, and this is about to be captured uh, with relative ease. Now, there is an auto victory condition way over there. If that hex there is captured, uh, that uh, that puts the rebels in automatic victory routine. Uh, it's really difficult for all of the. There's another place where you can get VPs as well, and that's if you if you control all the border crossings. And that's basically not going to happen because it's so easy for the Russians to come in and put one unit on one. So it's going to block that. Uh, but uh, so there's that. So what that means is the best you can do without a ceasefire pluses and minuses is get basically four VPs. One, two, three. And where was the fourth one? Ah, the F airfield four. You need seven as the Ukrainians to win. So the Ukrainians have to force the rebel player to not want a ceasefire. Now, the rebel player, as best I can figure, doesn't really care if there's a ceasefire or not. Because once the Russians get into the game, even if the Russians are moving at half, they can 
they also, you know, they're going to play the game and wait to see if uh, a ceasefire does not happen that next turn, and then they can start, A, killing units, but B, powerhouse by rail, or even the, even the, uh, even the rebels can powerhouse by rail down to here, capture that hex, and it's game over for, for the Ukrainians. So I'm not sure that the play testing was done well enough here for the victory conditions. Everything else is fine. It's, 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 it's kind of a, the rebels kind of just sit around and take a beating. It's very difficult for them to kind of pull together enough force to hold off in, you know, particular areas for very long. There's lots of uh, air support and artillery support and non-lethal support for taking out mobs. So if you don't want to lose Western favor, Western support, you use non-lethal means of removing the mobs. And that works very well. So, so you can discount, really discount the Western support issue almost 100%. The only time you might uh, face an issue with Western support or Soviet support for that matter, is if you're doing conducting an attack and there's a media unit in there and you're doing a physical attack against a hex and that media unit ends up being eliminated, which would be the ideal option if I had something like, uh, where was that media unit that died or went back to the box? These guys are being attacked by all these guys here and uh, then we would make a roll on the on the media table. Now what's not very clear is if both sides have a media counter. So for instance, if I, uh, I think I have a media counter here somewhere. Maybe I don't. Yeah, I do, there we go. So if both sides have a media counter, they both get the roll. So now I can negate the negative effects of this media counter. So if you start playing the chits pretty uh, carefully and thoughtfully and have them in the right stacks, and particularly if you move them around with, these are the primary military forces that have any punch in the game until the Soviets come, uh, the Russians come, I should say, then then you can mitigate all of these media things and the mob and all this sort of stuff, and they, they, they become a, a non-event. So you, you negate all that out. Now it's just a straight-up fight between forces based, and then, you know, based on whatever column shifts you get for cities or whatever the case may be, you just pile in and you try and not roll a one, because it's a standard uh, CRT deal where you roll a one, it sucks, meaning that you either lose a step as the attacker or you don't, uh, or you get no result. Uh, so even at five to one, that's going to hurt because once you lose these forces, there's no replacements. There's no replacements for these guys either. Uh, so it becomes, it becomes a, an attrition game then, which is not a bad thing. It's just... These guys are going to walk over pretty much everything on the field, particularly if in the early couple of turns you didn't take a lot of, you roll well for your reinforcements and you can get quite a few support units, then you're going to be in a very powerful position to kind of clear the map quickly, establish control, and, uh, and then you, it's kind of game over for, the, for these guys, for the rebels, until the Russians arrive, arrive right? Because then the Russians arrive and they bring in their rockets and... You know, they've got all these actually little battalions of, of forces, which are not super strong, uh, but are pretty effective. But they do bring lots of support units. And it's almost like there's too many support units, really. I don't know what the limitation is on, on applying them. Uh, you can just apply a dozen to one attack or whatever, but there's a bunch. Here's a tank support, for instance. Uh, so so the, Russians, the Russians have to... They can, you can get up to four per turn that come in, but you've got to roll a six to get them. And uh, you only add the Russian support die roll, which is currently set at one, and the Western support is set at zero, uh, because I've been very careful about losing support, because losing support impacts um, reinforcements as well. It comes off your die roll. So what am I saying? Let's talk about the, that. So that so that's what that's how kind of how the game is playing out or has played out at turn nine of fifteen. And you know I I just I don't see I don't see a how the Ukrainians can win first of all, and secondly I I don't know I don't know that uh, you know if I bring all these guys in here, fine they come in 
uh, I would probably bring him in over here and just book him down all the way down to here and try and capture that hex as quickly as possible. And the Ukrainian response to that would be to try and put enemy units in as many little towns as possible to slow them down or just make a reinforce this, right? So, rail movement's also funky too because you can actually pass through uh, enemy enemy control areas and both sides could use the same railway in the same turn because it's a month long turn. All right, so what does this game do for you? It puts you in the decision space at basically, you know, the overall theater commander here. You're uh, running the, the rebellion, as the case may be, or the nationalist side. Uh, you have a limited information because all these counters are going to be face down most of the time. Uh, although we know that these are regulars, so we just turn them, I leave them face up. And I would probably leave the Soviets face up as well. Uh, but these other guys, you don't know whether there's a mob under one of these counters or whether it's a, a combat unit. So you've got to go into every battle prepared. Uh, I tip, excuse me, I typically go into an attack with one of these units and a militia unit of some stripe, uh, like one of these guys, uh, so it can absorb the losses because you don't have to take losses from your, your regular combat units. You can just pick whoever dies. So always take one of those, always take a media unit with you, uh, always take, uh, you know, and use artillery support. And if there's a mob there, you use the non-lethal stuff and you kind of grind out uh, Caption Dantesk and this other little town here. Uh, as a you know, time-space continuum thing, as I said, it's a month-long turn. So the movement rates are fairly limited given the, this, the space of time, but I imagine uh, this, the, the, the span of time, I should say, uh, so the interaction here is uh, all we, we're foot slogging and driving trucks on probably relatively crappy roads, I imagine. So there's that. I think I've discussed the player objectives fairly extensively. You know, it's uh, gather up seven VPs, but there are really only four that you can guarantee, uh, assuming that the wording is correct and that this is one VP. If it's not, if it's not, it's still one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm still going to be one VP short of getting of gaining victory, as the as you need seven to win. So that is kind of screwed up. Uh, I can't tell you how accurate the OB is. You know, massa manus, right? The whole thing was kind of designed as this war was happening, according to the designer. I ended up having to rummage around on uh, Consum World while there were only 35 posts. You've still got to go through every freaking post to find anything out about what's going on and follow the threads and follow the follow-ups and all that. So that was annoying. No support on uh, BGG that I can see and or Board Game Geek. And, uh, you know, it's a magazine game. You get what you pay for. And I think it's probably a great game if you want to tinker. If you want to tinker with what was going on here, this is a great game. And I think you'll you'll enjoy it and you'll you'll have some fun. You clearly need to uh, finish playtesting it for the designer because uh, he he obviously had a goal in mind, and that was that you would both be uh, trying to influence the die rolls on ceasefires, and that's going to give you victory points. Well, if you choose not to do that, then one side cannot win, and to me that just doesn't make sense. So maybe that's what happened. Great. So some designer notes around that would have helped reconcile what the intent was and would help me understand why you chose to do what you did with the design. And that would make it, uh, you know, make it more palatable to me to, to accept the victory conditions as they are. But right off the bat, first thing when you look at it, uh, at the game, you read the VCs and you go, hang on a sec, <laughs> these dudes can't win. Oh, well, maybe these ceasefires are really important. So you dig around in ceasefires and you try to reconcile what's going on there. Well, what if I don't What if I don't try to influence the ceasefire role? Because clearly as the Ukrainians, you absolutely don't want to because you're going to lose a VP. So <laughs> don't do that. So now you've got to force the rebels to do it. Well, if the rebels don't give a shit, they can just wait for the Russians to come. It's not going to work. I don't think. <laughs> so, uh, his, logistically, the supply, it has supply. It's pretty naughty. You know, it's the standard uh, lose half your moving points, blah, blah, blah. But uh, you, you gotta, all you're going to be able to do is trace back to a supply source, 
which is any town in a province you uh, are controlling uh, or that the enemy doesn't have units in. So that's pretty easy and it's any length as well. So not really very stringent on that. And it has the standard, you know, half movement, half defense, half attack type of thing or whatever the case may be. It doesn't even really matter. It never really came up except for one time. Uh, historical, historically, historical narrative. After watching a lot of uh, video on the Ukrainian uh, fighting, I've uh, been following this fairly closely because I did play the Ukrainian crisis uh, about six or eight months ago from Brian Train, and we're going to have a talk about that in a second. Uh, but this, this I think, gives you the feel for the kind of swirling, we're moving here, we're moving there, trying to capture a town, and someone leaves the town and you you know, move some guys in. It's very hard for the Ukrainian nationals to really uh, do the whack-a-mole thing. Uh, and I think it's hard for the rebels to build a defensive force here because they've got really crappy units. Everything, the best defensive strength is two. I think the maximum, I forget what the stacking limit is in the city. Now we're going to have to look. I think there's a special rule for cities. I think it's four, whereas everything else is three, uh, which means you can have a defense of eight. So uh, now you're going to get two shifts to the left because you're in the city. Yeah, that's right, four, four units. Uh, and let's say we, we apply some air and some arty and some other bits and pieces. I can get this attack up to a decent two or three to one, and I'll I'll chip away at you over a couple of turns. Uh, if I can get it up to four to one, then I'm going to knock you out probably in, definitely in two turns if I'm if I'm lucky, unless I roll a one, uh, and I just keep feeding militia units in it to to absorb the attack losses. But a lot of fighting for one hex, right? Uh, for one VP. All right. It's, and, you know, it, interestingly enough, you know, the, the nationalists started, uh, you know, didn't lose control of this for a very long time. So uh, and they don't start out with it in their control. Anyway, uh, I think, you know, I think the rules are relatively clear. I, I, I lacked clarity around Western support and how to increase Western support. It doesn't seem to really happen uh, unless it's through media die rolls. And same for the Soviet support. Uh, the ceasefire rule is interesting, but slows everything down to a, a grind. So once again, that fascinating, but I'm not sure that it is uh, 100% effective. Anyway, that's Opaque War. Let me show you the cover of the magazine so you can go find it online if you choose to get it. Look at the big Russian, uh, Russian individual there with big hat. So uh, there you have it. The, Rus the Russo-Ukrainian conflict of 2014. A curiously interesting game. Not for everybody. Um, once again, it's a magazine game. Ten pages of rules or eight pages of rules, I think. Uh, thereabouts. And... You know, I, I, I'm, I'm slow, I'm very quickly becoming weary of, uh, of investing time and effort into magazine games. This, I, I chose to do it because there's not a lot on the topic. So I think it was worth the experience, but I certainly wouldn't pay $30 for this uh, magazine and game. I would uh, pay something less. All right. Hope you guys enjoyed that little overview. Sorry that took so long. 18 and a half or 19 minutes. All the very best to you. Ciao.